Welcome to CMAG. Uh, my name's Mark Bailey. I'm Assistant Director of Exhibitions and Collections here, and I'm also uh, the uh, curator of the exhibition Please Ray, The Land, a 20 year survey. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Kirsty to you this afternoon. Uh, but first I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the, on the land, of the land on which we're meeting, um, the Ngunnawal people, and the particular, uh, their contribution to culture in the city we live in and to the region in which has inspired Kirsty's practice. A special welcome to Chris Burke in LA. Thank you for coming along this afternoon, Chris. Um, <laughs> Kirsty's um, a distinguished artist in the ACT. She was a very early graduate of the School of Art uh, in 1987, after which time she established her own studio and became a lecturer for the next 16 years in the glass workshop at the then School of Art. In that time, she influenced virtually a generation of young artists. Um, not surprisingly, like a large number of artists who, upon leaving their full-time work commitments or teaching com commitments, enter into a new phase of our creative development. And in 2004, Kirsty was the recipient of an Arts ACT Creative Arts Fellowship and also the CAPO Rosalie Gascoigne Memorial Award. In 2016, Kirsty became inaugural creative director of the Canberra Glassworks, a position she held for the next two years. Um, it's really then my pleasure to hand over to Kirsty to inform you more about her practice. Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks, Mark. Welcome here today, and I fully, fully support the acknowledgements of place voiced already by Mark. I would like to thank everyone at CMAG for making this exhibition possible, especially Mark, as the curator of the, of the show, for his enduring dedication to, the, to it, and his insightful curating, and for his understanding of my work from the past 20 years. I'd also like to thank CAPO and Canberra Glassworks, CAPO for the 2014 fellowship I was awarded for work towards this exhibition, and to the Glassworks for the 2016 Creative Fellowship. Both I have greatly appreciated. Today, I'd like to discuss my art practice, which is my life, by having a closer look at what, it, what that is, how and when I end up at the studio, and how and why I head away from the studio where I am each day in body and in mind for making and for thinking. I've included some images of work not in the exhibition alongside images of places away from the studio to illustrate what shapes and guides my practice. This July, I'll celebrate 30 years of my studio in Pialago. Over the past uh, years, I've come to spend more time outside the studio and realise the value of this time towards making. As my recent Research reading has expanded. Writing has become nearly a daily routine for me. It's a tool I use now to develop ideas. I write in the mornings, nearly every morning before the sun is up, before the, round me, before the world around me floods my day. It may be for only 20 or 30 minutes, but my thoughts then are alive with clarity. If this time is broken by the radio, phone, food, I lose those thoughts. They quickly become crowded out by the sounds of the everyday. As I write, words form images for new work. Words have shape, form and colour beyond their written form. Threads of the same place, for the same season, for the same reason, remain through my work over the past 30 years. Some tracks I walk just get deeper. Some fade, some return, weaving their way back into my sights, but not always my footfall. Silence and solitude from the everyday are essential experiences for me to find a voice for thoughts and for filtering and fermenting ideas. Areas to the south and west of Canberra are where I go. Time spent in these areas are my field research. There's a valley inside Namaji, Namaji National Park where I breathe deeply. Today I'll focus on that valley, Gudjanbi, 
and the act of returning to a place as a way of trying to let you in to why I make and what I create. Ready Cut Cottage in Gudjumbi Valley is where I undertook a five-week artist residency in 2009 through the wonderful program that Craft ACT run in conjunction with Namaji National Park. It's a place that I continue to return to for a frost, for a sunrise, or for a few days stay back in the cottage. Gudjumbi is a valley of layers of history, of bush and boundaries, of loss and vacancy, of change. It's part of the story of Canberra and beyond. It's a place I have known of and visited since childhood, then and now loving the freedom of a day away. It's also a valley of rock shelters, of Aboriginal painting and implements, of dispossession, of dingoes and wild dogs, of second settler farming, and now National Park. It's a place where I attempt to gain an understanding of attachment to place as a non-Indigenous Australian. I go alone, I go with close friends, those with knowledge in areas I'm not so versed in. Gudjanby as a place has been extremely important to me in focusing, in slowing down, in no longer setting out for the summit, but exploring the way. Scottish author and walker Nan Shepherd, in her brilliant little book, The Living Mountain, describes not walking up the mountains, being the Cairngorm Mountains in Scotland, but walking into the mountains in exactly the same vein as John Muir, father of the National Park System um, in America, said that going out was really going in. Concentrating one's walking does not restrict knowledge but allows a deepening of it. By focusing in, I feel I am understanding, I feel my understanding broaden and encompass so much more. For a time, I wondered if focusing like this may make my seeing and thinking become too narrow, even parochial, but have been persuaded not when reading Robert McFarlane's introduction to the book, The Living Mountain, where he explains the, an interesting history of the word parochial. Parochial is the adjectival form of parish and has come to mean insular and a mind turned inwards upon itself. But in earlier times, the parish was not a perimeter but an aperture, a space through which the world could be seen, and the idea that we learn by scrutiny of the close at hand. And I, I ask myself, has Gudjumbi Valley become my parish? Heading back to Gudjumbi. It's also about getting lost. It's about, as well as following tracks, into a place physically and mentally. Getting lost in it is equally important. I believe, as Rebecca Solnit in her book, A Field Guide to Getting Lost, discusses that unless we allow ourselves to get lost, we will never discover anything new. Getting lost doesn't necessarily mean that you won't find your way out. It can be as simple as letting the familiar fall away. In past times, explorers set out for new horizons. They rarely thought of themselves as lost. Sure, they didn't know where they were, but that was the point of the journey, exploration. So back to the valley. I could talk of the many incredible things I've seen out there and experienced whilst, whilst out there. But I'd like to impart a sense of feeling that the residency program to stay a while in the valley allows and in return encourages. Uh, at the 10 year anniversary of Craft ACT residency program for an, uh, I think late last year, I wrote the following about my time in the valley to stay a while. I specifically don't use the word settle. It's such a colonial word of ownership, fences and gates tied up with contested landscapes and responsible for rabbits, weeds, erosion, loss of country, loss of habitat. Staying a while speaks of history, of layers, of Aboriginal past, of moths, of gathering and moving on and of return. In 2009, I stayed a while. It was hot, it was cold, it snowed. Outside I was a sponge, soaking in all I could by night, I rung, rung that sponge out. I wrote, read and drew, took some, filled the hot water bottle and eventually went to bed. The cottage. I like to think of it as a base, not home. A base. It's actually the same cottage as Mawson's Antarctic Hut, um, from the same company, Redson, Hudson's Ready Cut Cottage. Shelter, protection, warmth, isolation. Getting out there and the freedom of leaving. I've always been drawn to places outside the city and I've always loved solitude, so my stay in the valley was easy. Even before I reached the park boundary, things change, the landscape, my thoughts. I'm prepared for out there by the journey. 
that soft edge between, ca between Canberra and rural ACT, the blur between rural and park boundary, an old fence, a grid. The valley com comes into view. I descend into it, turn right off the main road, turn right through the gate, park, locate the key, dump bedding on the bedding, and open the front door. I'm here for a while, and outside calls. Outside and distance. The lure of distance, the blue of distance, the longing attached to it, and the colour of longing. Distance between blue and the golden side of green. I feel there is clarity in distance, so I head off in every direction. And thinking of clarity these days, I have to chuckle. As I age, my eye sees clarity in the distance, but not in the near. <laughs> clarity embedded in the distance. Jumping forward to April 2015, a few days in the cottage with printmaker Antonia Aitken. Words from my journal. Today, we walked up and over to Rendezvous Creek Valley. It's a beautiful, long, frost hollow valley stretching into the purple blue distance. It's so namaji. Black valleys, boulders, and wedge tails circling above. We walk, hardly talk, following tracks, sometimes animals, sometimes vehicle. We have a destination up the valley, but the way there is important. I haven't been up this valley since 1989, not past the site of Rowley's hut. Last time we had a break on the steps of the hut, this time on the grass around the burnt remains. Bits of the hut, bits of skeleton of the hut, like the bones of ruse, lie scattered in the vicinity. Stopping for a break, sustenance, water, longing sets in, my sights on the distance. As we sit, the beauty of the day is made even more special by the house of a dingo. The first since being there this time, Antonia records them. The howls are answered from the east. We stay for probably another hour. I wander, Antonia draws. But back in the Gudjumbi Valley, as I said earlier, from one point of view, I feel it's a valley of vacancy and loss. From another, it's a place of return. But two things that capture my attention and imagination are changing light and movement. Both signal new experience, both made possible by staying a while. Movement, in an otherwise still landscape, swift mobilisation of the mob can only mean movement from elsewhere. In 2009, that was often dingoes. Stand still, watch and wait. Then there's the hunt. It's fast, tiring, and it's brutal. Day in the valley, later in the, in the day, a hint of a ripple across the surface of the creek. Sit still, watch and wait. Such a platypus moment, so subtle, so quiet and special. Changing light. It's morning and I head out. The sun on my back. My shadow leading the way till midday when I rest and my shadow keeps close company. On the journey home I've circled the valley, heading back in the same direction that I left in the morning. Now my shadow trails me, getting longer, slower, keen to return with the evening to stay a while. Solitude. Solitude is important for me. Heading out there isn't an escape. It's a place to create distance and allows glimpses into an understanding of my place in it all. Memory has a landscape. A landscape has a memory of us as we do of it. We carve it, colour it, contour it. We are embedded in landscape as it is in us. For many years, my work has explored the intervention and attachment to place. Drawn to places distance from built environments, I continue this exploration. Investigating how we have shaped and marked place, and in turn, how place shapes our navigation, both physically and mentally across it and into it, my work brings together the external and the internal of both body and place. Landscape is not just a skin of a form, feature and surface that we so readily attach to a place. Landscape has an inside. Explorations take me deeper under the surface, into places and past the scene. My mind moves with the landscape, the body with the terrain. Tracks and traces left by those who have been before still shape and influence my presence and passage, my comfort or discomfort within that place. I need the day to fade, to start to digest where I've been, as I need the sunrise to try and make sense of yesterday, of memory, of tomorrow. We live under an ocean of air. That ocean has volume. It lives and breathes as we breathe it. It's charged with place. 
imbued with what lies below, tainted and tinged, tasting of what's been and what is to come. I ingest it, I digest it, filter and ferment it. That digestion is a, like a conversation with myself, with my gut. It feeds and nourishes my thinking towards making. Early works in this exhibition, I think, have a sense of immobility to them. They're anchored to place. The place they occupy and their presence now seems attached only to their footprint. I'd like recent works to have a sense of fluidity to them. That form is still possibly moving, absorbing elements of place, still dissolving, evolving or dissolving to occupy space. Making. I have some sense, some understanding of what I make, but not all the answers to why I make, but that's what keeps me making, getting out there, researching, reading and creating. The more I know and understand my materials for making, the more I feel I can put certain qualities of them aside for another time, for another idea. Time in the field is crucial for me to gain enough clarity to return to the studio and make. Otherwise, glass is a material and the processes attached to it can clutter studio time. There have been times over the years when I've been stuck making work and not known if I should stay put in the studio to figure it out or to head out away from it. In 2010, I undertook a four-week artist residency in the old gold mining village of Hill End through the Bathurst Regional Art Gallery program. I was excited about this opportunity as it came just a few weeks before I was heading off to Canada to spend a winter semester as visiting artist at the Alberta College of Art and Design in Calgary. I've always been drawn to residencies away from glass facilities. Time to think, read and draw, distance from my material. I thought I would use the four weeks of Hill End to plan what I would make in Canada, but I got stuck, very stuck. Where I was was new and where I was going to go was also new. But the result was a body of work on paper and in photo montage that I still value today. Interestingly, um, when I arrived in Canada, I started making immediately with no hesitation. The work came to be about distance. The distance travel creates gives much needed perspective to views and to ideas. Distance is interesting, as it can be looking forward or it can be looking back. Distance looking back allows a deeper understanding of that perspective. Looking forward, it's often about the distance of blue, of longing, of the unknown that Rebecca Solnit so eloquently writes about. <coughs> Returning and change. I am a local, I have travelled and I've returned and I always look forward to my return. Why? When and how do we believe in belonging? Can we belong somewhere, and if so, how? Places change, we change. What am I returning to, and how does my work over the past 20 years address this? Well, I, I don't think it does within one work, but it may over a body of work, and hopefully within the work of the exhibition here at CMAG. The feeling of belonging comes possible with understanding change and lies within a deeper knowledge of issues around the work and of cultural understanding. I can enjoy, feel comfortable, can return to and linger, and linger in places that I don't belong to. And these are really important experiences to help me figure out why I feel attached to other places. Have places such as state and national parks enabled attachment to a degree, as they have made place publicly available, accessible and therefore knowable, where that attachment becomes possible? Looking back, I can now reflect on being shown these places and their value, their differences and distances as a child. It has instilled in me an ongoing inquiry and appreciation of these places that is supported by a deeper understanding of them. I continue to build and deepen connections to these places. Art school was critical. My years at Canberra School of Art, as it was then in the early 1980s, were the best ever. Full days of foundation classes with incredible teachers. Dan Brown, Neil Roberts, Judy Silver, and of course, Klaus Moyer, to name a few. The beauty of my early at Glass education was that no one knew how to do that much. We learned and discovered processes by getting it wrong, by getting lost with the material and processes. Those teachers opened gates to pathways of thinking, 
and conceptual ex exploration that I had not known how to access or that existed. Jan Brown insisted that she taught us not how to draw but how to see. She taught us about light and shadow. My earlier stained glass years in the 1970s showed me about light and colour. So 30 and 40 years later, do I have answers for how and why I make? Not really, but that's the exciting thing. Not having all the answers technically, conceptually, or about the material glass is what keeps me making, as I've said. In the studio, I keep learning so much about my material. I'm in awe of writers such as Rebecca Solnit, Nan Shepherd, and Robert McFarlane, who write so eloquently and clearly around the thinking that underpin a lot of my, underpins a lot of my work. They express so clearly in word what I try to express in form. They guide me to new ways of seeing and new ways of perceiving ideas. This should be my artist statement. I see my practice now as balancing time between being in and out of the studio and finding a balance between reading, writing and making. Finally, I'd like to say a few more thanks to those who've contributed to the development of my practice over many years. The writer Zhuzhi Zobosle, who's written so insightfully about my work over the past years. To Zelko Markov, Markov and Jeff Farquhar-Stu for the fabrication of various components in the work. And to David Patterson for nearly 20 years of photography. But lastly, to the wider Canberra arts community, the Canberra Glassworks community and my local Queanbeyan community. I might like, love solitude, but I need you all, and you've been so supportive. I'm proud that here in this city, there is a gallery and a museum that's about and for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we are going to take the opportunity to take questions from the audience and my colleague Claire has a mic that she'll bring around if anyone has any issues that they'd like to raise with Kirsty for um, clarification or make some queries. Or for Mark too. <laughs> Richard. Kirsty, thank you for a beautiful talk. I'm really interested in the where the work for you becomes concrete. There's been such a development and reflection on your practice and it's a constant state of evolution. But in the immersion in the environment and that, that in critical time in the studio, where does the work become concrete? When does it, when does it form for you? Does it may happen at different times, and it may have changed over the year, uh, over over time. But I'm just interested in your thinking when you're out in space, and when and mm. when you're thinking yeah. through your ideas. No, I think I know what you mean. It definitely becomes concrete when I'm in the studio and I have my hands on the material. Um, I think after so many years, it, I do know the material well. But as I say, it keeps teaching me things, and it has a habit of doing that. Um, but it's definitely it's having the hands on it and going back to those basic qualities of the material that draws me to it and that I need for that particular work. So it's out there that I figure out what qualities I need, whether that be glass or not, but it's going to the studio, picking up a sheet of glass and knowing what I want to do with it. Hi Kirsty, thank you, that was beautiful. Um, I was wondering, in your time, have you done residencies at Bullseye? And if you have, have you influenced their colour palette at all? Or begged for blues? Or do you have, have a blue no named after you yet? <laughs> no, I have no idea. But I know that as a student at school, Klaus sent over slides of me crushing glass, squatting on the floor, concrete floor of the glass studio with my mask, my safety glasses, crushing my own glass, sieving it, having an insincorator to actually crush it for a while, um, that they then started to make for it crush glass. But no, I, I don't know. Mel. Sometimes when you put your own work out, either in an exhibition or you're taking it to get photographed, you learn something more about it. Did you? Or did you have any insights into something about your practice that you hadn't really realised 
before you put the exhibition out? Like, you know, with such a survey of work. A couple of things. I think one thing was as the work started to go up, just that seeing space around it. You know, we normally see our work in a lot tighter space, commercial spaces, a lot, lot tighter. And as the work started to go up in the walls here at CMAG, which is such a beautiful space, I did see it in a different light. In fact, I saw it probably closer to how I'd sort of envisaged it, envisaged it right at the start, because there is space is so much so important to me. It's detail and space. So yeah, it did. Um, well, look, it was interesting seeing pairings of work with a lot of years between them. Um, that was interesting. I'm for a cup of tea. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Thank you everyone so much for coming along this afternoon. Um, uh, just a couple of brief words in, um, in rounding up. That is, uh, there's a broad range of um, community programs uh, that's been developed by my colleagues in Access and Learning um, throughout the duration of the exhibition. Um, some distinguished um, individuals with expertise um, in the area of glass, both uh, locally and in the international context. Um, we'll be speaking about Kirsty's practice um, over the next couple of months. So please keep an eye on the CMAB website for um, information about those upcoming events. Um, please convey that to your friends and invite them to come along and have a look at the exhibition. Um, please join me in thanking Kirsty Wright. <laughs>